Well, thank you, Heather, for inviting me. And uh, when, when we first spoke, you, you, you mentioned about, you said about uh, starting a, or the, the, the talk with a question. And uh, so I, the question I thought of was, can thought be visualized? And my immediate and obvious answer was yes. And every gesture, in fact, is, is a visualization of, of, a, of a thought, um, which actually made a very short talk. So I rephrase that question in how can thought be visualized or how, how is it thought, thought is visualized? And an obvious example is art. All art is a visualization of thought. And in particular, drawing is the bottom one, isn't it, on here? Yes. This is from an, an, an essay by Karen uh, Kaczynski called Drawing is a New Painting. She's a professor of art history at the University of Massachusetts, and she examines the rise of drawing as a major medium, or anti-medium, as she calls it, in the contemporary period, ranging from expressive and reproductive practices to the relationship of hand drawing to technology. And I'm not going to read this out. I'm to, I, this is one part of a whole page of um, definitions of her definitions of drawing that she's extracted from other other people. Now, I would like to add another definition, which is kind of hinted at in here, that drawing is a trace of a line of thought. And I like the idea of the word dragan, which is an old English term for drawing. It is the idea of something that is dragged across a surface, leaving a, its trace imprinted. And there's also this idea of designo, dis um, being about how we protect, uh, project what something could be so one is about a trace of an experience and the other is about the uh, a projection of a potential experience and, and sometimes something in between. And also drawing can change the way we think. When I think of drawings, have changed the way that I think. I think of Leonardo and Goya and many others. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've all thought of, you've all had images in your mind that changes, images that change the way you think. Um, I did try to get uh, an original drawing of the Apple logo, um, which I couldn't find, but um, I would say, suggest that that was, I mean, you've now got up with that Apple logo in your head, right? That's, not, not, that's a, an image, a drawing, in a way, that not only changed the way we think, but changed the way we behave. Um, I recently did an interview with Anita Taylor, who's the founder and director of the Jura Drawing Prize, um, which was an interview in the January, I think, issue of the magazine. And I asked her, can drawings change the way we think? And the response was, well, yes, absolutely. You can draw what you're thinking, and you can see what you're thinking. Go backwards. In a very different way. And for me, she says, it's the act of drawing that changes the way I think, and I think it changes the way other, uh, other people think when they do it too. And drawing is such a, di a simple and direct medium. It is so co closely related to the hand and the brain in a way that no other media are because they depend on many technical interfaces. And for me, the form of the artwork and its subject matter should be identified that meaning is communicated through and by the specifics of information, of visualization, sorry. This is a drawing of a neuron drawn in 1865 by a German neuroanatomist, Otto Friedrich Conditers. And it was around 1860 that Dieters provided the most comprehensive description of the nerve cell that is known to exist at the time. And with nothing but fine instruments, sharp eyes, and a dazzling hand, he picked out the microscopic neurons and their components. And the drawing, the drawing shows a, a cell body in the center, the, the soma, 
which I always think of as an eye, and a thin axion running from out of one end and, the, and a, web of continue, a web of dendrites uh, uh, protruding on the other. And he postulated that dendrites must fuse to form a continuous network. This is a drawing from 1875 by the physician Camilo Golgi, who invented what is known as black reaction cell staining techniques, which is a way of allowing anatomists to view in individual neurons in their entirety for the first time. This drawing is of a dog's uh, a factory bulb, uh, which is a neural st structure in the, in the forebrain uh, involved in the sense of smell. And 14 years after the discovery of the black reaction to technique, the Spanish pathologist and, and neurologist, a neuroscientist, sorry, San Diego Cajal, uh, took up the new method and applied it to study of the entire nervous system. Making two, and he made it two important con contributions. He was the first to describe dendritic spines uh, that extend out of the branching arm of the neur neuron. And, and he also considered each neuron it's not a, as a discrete unit rather than a single cell, rather than a, a merely a, a small part of a large, um, a large group. His pioneer pioneering investigation or investigations of microscopic structure of the brain has led to many uh, to being designated uh, the father of uh, modern neuroscience I'll actually I'll keep that keep that on must this was a time when microphotography was not yet established enough to for scientists to record anatomical drawings so you realize that these are all drawings and so they resorted to the drawing under a microscope. And although the drawing promoted close attention to detail, it also had its limitations. It required an observer to act in the act of drawing to actually highlight details that he or she considered important. Uh, a key feature of one scientist, scientist can pass looking at one, one particular aspect of a um, uh, feature can actually pass unnoticed by another. And two, two expert anatomists drawing from one from a single sample can produce actually two separate distinct drawings or radically different diagrams. So you can think of these diagrams, the last three I've shown, as being a trace of what the drawer, the scientist, thought of as important. And this, this, this discovery of the black reaction technique, now known as the Golgi method, set in motion a powerful research program into the brain that is still being played out today. These are um, uh, the brain imaging techniques, which many of you may, may know. I'll just, just list them here. The history of science is filled with examples of how, in a way, quantum leaps in our understanding were made possible by advances in imaging technology. The microscope and the telescope extended the boundaries of the human eye to enable views of the infinity, infinitely small and infinitely large. And similarly, current imaging technology in neuroscience is, e is equally revolutionary, allowing us to sim simultaneously view a brain structure and also its function and the relationship between them. And the term microscope is uh, often used and the wonderful examples of, we've, we've seen uh, what we may know of, of uh, imaging techniques. So this is just a few of my favorites of the last sort of few years. Sorry. This is a diffusion MRI, which was produced in 2006. And diffusion MRI is a method that is used to uncover major axon pathways in the brain by measuring the motion of water within a group of, or tract of axons traveling from one point of the organ to another. The method is capable of detecting the kind of a natural diffusion of water of molecules along these tracks and, and is completely non-invasive. So this image we're looking at is 
the, the top image is the looking down at the brain with the back of the head at the bottom of the image and the forehead at the top. And in the view, in this, in the view be, beneath it, we're looking at the subject at the back of the head. And each line, in a way, does not represent a single axon. It represents thousands of them traveling along these pathways in groups. And the color indicators indicate the axis of which each fiber is uh, orientated. So the green is from front to back, the red from left to right, and the blue from top to bottom. Going on its own, sorry. Stay where you are. Right. Uh, this is what I actually call axon drawing. Um, it's just reacting to my finger as a. Okay. Go on to the next. This was a study um, which came out in April this year, which was the effect of LSD on the brain. And it revealed um, basically, it was people took a trip in the name of science. And they it uses three different brain imaging techniques where the scientists measured blood flow, functional connections within the, uh, between the brain and, the, and, and networks and the brain waves of the volunteers, both on and off the drug. What's interesting, the brain scans revealed that the trippers experienced images through information drawn from many parts of the brain and not just the visual cortex at the back of the head that normally processes the information. Under the drug, uh, regions that were once segregated spoke to one another. And under the influence, brain networks that deal with vision, attention, movement, hearing became far more connected, leading to what looked like a more, what we call a unified brain. But at the same time, other networks broke down. Uh, they found that further images showed that other brain regions that usually form a network became more separated in a change that accompanied users feeling uh, feelings of oneness with the world, but also a loss of uh, identity, which they call ego dissolution. The, the professor who led this team was uh, Professor David Nutt from Imperial College. And he said of this, this talk, he said, this is what neuro neuroscientists have been waiting for for the last 50 years. He said, this is the neuroscientist what the Higgs boson was to particle physics. We don't know these profound how these profound effects were produced. It is, difficult, it is diff too difficult to do. Scientists were either scared or couldn't be bothered to overcome the enormous hurdles to, to, get, to be done at this time. Um, it's interesting, David Nutt, <laughs> there's a personal angle to this, is that he was um, father to uh, my kids' friends at school. Um, so I, I, I know him and, and, and drew his kids around. And also, it's also personal anger is that I grew up in the 60s, so there's another sort of a personal anger which we can sort of uh, talk about at another time. But these are very, you know, very important uh, images that are coming out at the moment about the imaging of the brain. I want to talk about uh, artists that are currently... Um, inspired by neuroscience. This is, uh, what's going on? I'll put that down. This is uh, a work by Julia Buntain, who is the uh, director of Sci Art Center in America, and also the editor of Sci Art Magazine. She was also the guest editor of the latest issue of uh, Interalia magazine, which is, uh, which is actually still online and available, called Memory Networks. 
And this is an overlaid computer renderings of a human ne neuron from eyewear, which is a online app game where you actually um, try and work out where the pathways of neurons are. And with M uh, MIT, the, and the work explores the shape taken by 23 overlaid neurons, each centered on the top of the core or cell body of a previous cell. These two works are by an artist, Elizabeth Jameson. The top is called Kaleidoscope, and the bottom image is uh, neuroplasticity. Now, shortly before, after Elizabeth was um, diagnosed with MS in 1991, she became obsessed with the inside of her mind. And she would undergo brain scan, brain scan after brain scan to track the progress of her disease a process that unlocked what she calls a deep fascination with the architecture of the brain. Confronted with a, a view of the magnetic uh, MRI scans, as I said, she was able to, to see exactly what her imperfect brain looked like. But she had no, bio, she had no art, artistic background, she had no background in art. So she began using her brain scan to celebrate her mind reinterpreting the images that represented her ever-changing understanding of, of living with a progressive disease. And in the process, she became an artist. And then she says, in many ways, art has become my voice. And a quick plug, she's featured in the next issue of the uh, Interalia magazine. This is a latest work by a neuroscientist and artist, Greg Dunn, or and a collaboration with Brian Edwards, who is an artist and applied physicist. It's called Self-Reflected. And it was created to reveal the nature, as he says, of human consciousness. And bridging the connection between the mysterious three-pan microscopic, macroscopic brain and the microscopic behavior of neurons. He says, Self-Reflected offers unprecedented insight of the brain into itself revealing through the technique which, he calls, which is reflective micro-etching, the enormous scope and the beautiful and del delicately balanced um, neural choreographies. My, and micro-etching, when you, when you view the work, it actually changes as you move across it, so the light reflecting on it will change so that it will actually shimmer. This is the work in four size, and the piece is massive, and is lit by a 24 foot long array of 144 ultra bright LEDs along the banks of the, and the when, when <laughs> So that the, the, the lights are programmed to fade in and out one another. So when the viewer is standing in a sort of what he calls a, the sweet spot, where all the reflections of the micro etching are aimed, the light source am, animates the piece with a sweeping dart of light across the LEDs again and again. And he says the work is, was created to remind us that the most marvelous machine in the known universe is at the core of our being and at the root of our shared humanity. Again, this is a, in, the, in the latest issue, there's an exclusive interview where he, he discusses the whole technique of this work and, what it, and um, how he says it, is it, the, the brain is directly understanding itself. There's a couple of works by an artist, American artist, China Blue. And her brain bank project consisted, consisted of Imagining Blue. This is one of the works, Imagining Blue, or a still from it, which is a sculpture in, uh, installation, which capturing four classes of brain waves, alpha, beta, gamma, and theta, each of which are observed when the user's brain is in a particular state. The alpha, the alpha state is observed when 
during wakeful, wakeful relaxation. The beta waves occur during a wakeful state, waking state of consciousness. The slower theta state is observed during meditative conditions, and the gamma wave state is observed during alert uh, awake behavior, and is considered, considered a way of measuring consciousness. So that's imagined in blue, and this is mind draw, where the brain waves of individuals sense through a custom, this customized EEG software controls the light and sound of the interactive, interactive sculpture. It kind of dynamically produces the drawings in front of them. This is a, a work, an installation work by an American-born and Korean-raised uh, artist, multidisciplinary artist, Lisa Park. And in the past few years, she's been experimenting with um, biosensors, the brainwave heart rate um, monitoring devices, as a vehicle for manifesting her inner states. And her recent performances, um, which is, this is the first one, NUI, uh, anyway, Anywhere, sorry, and anywhere too. Anywhere means beautiful thoughts. Involved using commercial EG headset as a self-monitoring tool to obtain real-time feedback of her emotional reactions. So the performances were done in an attempt to visually, visually reflect her um, uh, the vibrations of her mind, which she expressed through uh, water. So basically, the headset went into a computer, the computer translated that into sound waves, the sound waves then went into these bowls of water, and the, and the water uh, vibrated depending on what, uh, what state of mind she was in. This was um, number, two, number two, which involved uh, 15 bowls of water. And she says in, in the first one, uh, the five poles of water, it was about calming my emotional state. It was, it was trying to meditate and calm myself. But as far as the second was concerned, I was focusing more on the emotional aspect. So it all depends on the EEG uh, brainwave headset I would use. The first one I used uh, uh, it was able to detect brainwave uh, frequencies. But the second one also detected um, attention, detected her facial movements as well. And these were all uh, um, sort of co coordinated within this computer program into sound waves, into frequency waves, which detected her emotional states. So and she put herself into emotional states of, of uh, what she says, frustration, meditation, engagement, boredom, excitement as uh, this kind of emotional values. And this idea of putting yourself into a um, meditative state and, and, and visualizing that, this is a, uh, a diagram of, from a book, uh, Abhidharma, of 17 thought moments. moments. And when I was start studying art and physics, I was also studying and practicing uh, Theravada Buddhism um, and studying the, particular, the, the book, the Abhidharma, which is basically an analysis of consciousness and its men mental faculties and um, its elements and the whole, th uh, the ideas of concepts of co uh, being and becoming and how this relates to contemplative practice and a way of being. And according to the Abhidharma, the mind occurs in both passive and active modes. And the passive way gives rise to the active when the stimulus is kind of is received. So in this diagram, you have what would be a thought moment, thought process, microsecond, more, less than that. And a complete thought, thought process according to the Abhidharma, occurs through the physical senses and also the mental senses. This is just a diagram of what they call the, the, the eye door um, 
process where a, um, a vibration is taken, I won't go through the whole uh, technical details of it, but a, a, in the passive state, Bavanga is seen as, or known as, it's difficult to translate, is seen as a sort of a passive uh, life continuum, if you like, um, which kind of vibrates for a moment when something is registered, is, when something comes into its its field, um, it then cuts off the flow, then turns the object into a sensor, which is then stimulated. Um, this idea of um, is then appropriated uh, uh, in in this sense of in in what they call eye consciousness, and then there is the function of receiving it, and then there's this function of investigating, uh, sorry, receiving, investigate, determining. And what's called Jivana, Jivana, which is how you react to that stimulus, which can be depending on um, your previous uh, experiences, can be uh, good or bad, and how that. Now this happens, and the act is then um, continued. To the next one, and this has happened very I mean, incredibly fast. This is not just, a, in a way, so we could say it's not just, a, it's not a, li it's a linear process. It's, it's, it's shown in this, but it's not a linear process because this is happening millions of times in the brain, both consciously and, and unconsciously, all the time. So that, um, I mean, an example would be, uh, you're thinking about something and you're driving, a, you're driving your car, and suddenly you realize, how did I get here? That that. And we've all done that, and I took, but you couldn't do, you couldn't pay attention to that process if you were driving the car. It's, it's a it's a function that's going on automatically in, in in the brain. So if you did pay attention to it, I mean full attention, um, you couldn't drive the car; you crash. Well, this is this is ideas. I say it's it's from. Uh, the book of Theravada Buddhism, and although it sounds theoretical, it's actually not theoretical at all. It's based on um, experience. It's based on a deep meditative uh, vipassana um, states which analyze uh, thought moments, consciousness. And, and this has been going on for two and a half thousand years. Um, so it's not a it's not a new it's not a new thing. And as I said, I, I st studied uh, fine art and physics and um, Theravada Buddhism, and I kind of these these kind of combined in a latest uh, series of works because I was finding there was there was, there was you had you know. Psi art, art, psi, whatever. And once I and there was something missing. There was something this this idea of the process of thinking, um, which was kind of getting lost, but both in my own work and also in a, a lot of psi art work, which was kind of just imaging. I felt was imaging or illustrating neuroscience rather than get into grips. So, so this is a, a, a new group of work. It's, and it kind of it was based on the. Um, a quote by David Bohm, which said, uh, well, kind of, we haven't really paid m much attention to the, to the thought as a process, to thought as a process. We've engaged in thoughts. We've only paid attention to its content, not the process. So these group of works were, um, this was called uh, Lines of Thought, number 28, and it was, it's, it was trying to get into the idea of, of, of using the process of thinking as to create the artwork. So a line is drawn in ink on black paper, but the line this is in uh, is not actually easy to you can't really see it. You can it's a very it's not very dis distinguishable. So. The process of remembering where the first line was, you then make the second line, and so on. 
remembering from the previous, the next responds, so on and so on. And so the drawer is drawing, if you like, in the, uh, myself, in the dark, but attending in navigating through the space of the paper, moving kind of through the time past to time present, but, and gradually as the ink dries, which may take a few minutes, the color and the form starts to reveal itself. But you, you continually, I continually keep, keep drawing using this idea of um, memory where the first line is, attention to the second line, and so on and so on. So th these are just a few ex uh, examples of the latest work of trying to create work which is thinking of, um, as I say, visualizing thought as a process. So after a while, as I say, the first line reveals itself with the ink drying on the, pro uh, on the pa black paper and the process of going back to, referring to that ther uh, Theravadapism thought moment of receiving and registering and of memory and making a, a, a volition, a, a sort of a, a, an act to the, what the next line is. So the, ni the lines respond, respond to the previous and gradually uh, the structure begins to unfold. This is um, a work called Forming. And this is Lines of Thought, again, number 27. These are all fairly small drawings because the, the concentration of working on this is, um, takes quite a while. Half a day, maybe. It's sort of, it's, it's, it's depending on what they're. And then the later ones, the more recent ones, are getting larger. Uh, this is called Lines of Thought Universal. And finally, um, it's called Brainscape. And I've, I was recently showing these to a, a, a curator for an exhibition. And he asked me, he said, can you, if, can you sum up what these, uh, what these works are about? I said, well, there was a kind of, kind of meditations on the process of thinking. And he, he looked at the work and, uh, and he looked at me and he looked at the work again and sort of just stroked his chin and just says, oh, okay. <laughs> um, in fact, I got the work in the exhibition, so that was fine. But uh, I just want to finish with a commercial break on um, the inter magazine, which I said... As um, Heather explained, it was it started in 2014, and uh, it is to explore the interactions between art, science, and consciousness. I originally put art, science, and spirituality, and that was too weighted. So spirituality sort of went out when consciousness is uh, sort of. And we've had th uh, three issues on uh, called when, with consciousness in mind, which. Um, interviews and have articles by some major sort of psychologists, neuroscientists um, in the world. Um, looking at part four for next year, which will actually look at uh, um, theories of consciousness, ideas of, on, on consciousness in the mind, both east and west. So I'm working with pe people in India. Um, and it's, there's a section in the magazine on emerging ideas, which anyone can submit to. The other, the other, the main part is where it's, I invite people to, to write articles and, and do interviews with. But the, the section emerging ideas is, um, I say, anyone can um, submit their images. It can be a visual article, it could be a, a written piece, whatever. We've had students from um, the MA course here uh, uh, have been uh, included in it. Um, and I just, just to say, if you 
look at the magazine. It's all online only. Um, we've got a lot of great issues coming up. I'm working with Heather for a big issue next year. Not big issue. <laughs> uh, huge issue on uh, interspecies intelligence. Uh, so, uh, so there'll be yes. There's a, a lot more, a lot more in themes coming up, and also I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of new thinking and people to sort of submit themes that they think should be, um, we should be looking at, should be covering. So, um, so emerging ideas is one section of the main main um, main magazine, um, and if you look at it, you'll see how to how to submit it. Um, which could be done as a as written, visual, audio, video, anything. And uh, thank you. <laughs>